You don't have to wait long for a bite when you are fishing around the mussel farms off the Coromandel. Join us for all the action as we go on a mussel barge safari and get amongst the fish. It's uh, taking a fair bit of line. <laughs> we get some great tips from the crew on how to fish the mussel barges and see how changing up techniques can help you catch fish. We also go for a dive at Goat Island and meet Monkey Face. Well, we're in the Coromandel. It's an absolutely beautiful day. You say that a lot on these sort of shows, but it's absolutely true. It's flat calm. We're on the Mussel Barge Safari, and we're heading to one of the local mussel farms to do a bit of spot of uh, snapper fishing around the barges. And I tell you what, these mussel barges are a really productive place to fish. And the Mussel Barge Safari, I've been on it a few times, and I always have a ball. On board today, we've got a whole group of different anglers, and I think they're all sort of nervous in anticipation, because you know what it's like when you go out on the charter, you just never know what's gonna happen. There's always a bit of pressure to catch a fish. And I think even the uh, skipper and the crew are feeling a bit of pressure to perform. We'll be fishing in just a minute, so uh, all the pressure will be off when the fish start coming over the side. Joining us on the trip today were a bunch of South Africans. A dad with his two boys enjoying some quality time, my mate Pete Jessup and his partner Jan, and my sister Pat who was visiting from the UK. The trip to the mussel farm allowed people to get rigged up, have an early morning cup of coffee and cut up the bait. There are literally heaps of mussel farms in the Coromandel and out into the Firth of Thames. We were going to fish some of the outer farms, which are about a 40 minute run from the dock at Takuma where the mussel barge leaves from. They run two trips a day, one leaves at 7am and the second trip about 1pm. Of course this is dependent on demand. The drive from Auckland is about two and a half hours, so if you book the 7am trip this means an early start. Well the crew have just moored up the boat and what they do, they don't anchor obviously because they catch the uh, mussel lines here, so that all they do is throw a hook over each end and get the boat in between two rows of mussel spats and you fish right down the channel there. So uh, we've got a boat working in the background, he's not harvesting mussels, he's actually just cleaning the mussel lines and adding new mussel boys. Because when they get a lot of weight on them with the growth of the mussels, it actually drags the boys down and they have to add more floats. So that's what they're doing, but that's enough activity to bring the snapper around. So let's get into the fishing. The girls on board immediately showed the guys how it was done, both catching fish on their first baits. We're on the board! Alright. <laughs> Pretty soon the fish were coming over the rails all around the boat. A good tip is to use a sinker that holds the bottom when you're using flashes or a ledger rig and don't let out too much slack line. This helps avoid tangles that can waste precious fishing time. Don't lift it, come on, don't lift it, don't lift it, hold it in the water, Jen. No, it might disappear. No, it'll disappear if you lift it. Don't lift it. There you go. It's not only the snapper that hang around the mussel farms, so you can expect to hook just about anything here. Kahawai, John Dory, Gurnard, and of course, kingfish. It's uh, taking a fair bit of line. <laughs> this is a uh, probably a kingy one, isn't it? Oh! Bugger! <laughs> How constrained was that? Well, I'll tell you what, it's been all go from the time the first bait went down. I've um, only really just got a chance to put a bait on the bottom and I've, I've caught a fish. I'm using a light rod just for a bit of fun. You can get yourself in trouble using light gear around here because there's a few kingies floating around the boat and I tell you if you hook up on those it's bedlam because they'll tangle every line on the boat or they'll bust you off on the muscles. So uh, yeah, heavier tackle tends to, tends to be the preference around here but uh, I'm, I'm only after a couple of snapper for a feed and uh, I'm happy on the light gear. It's giving me a good run actually this one. Oh, it's not a bad fish. I'll get the decky to net him for me. I won't risk trying to lift him on the boat with this light rod. There we go. A nice quality mussel barge snapper. He's actually spewing up mussels. He's got them in his mouth. Look at that. Not a big fish, but a good eater. No, 
We've gone to using flasher rigs. We're testing out uh, whether it was better to use stray line or, or a ledger rig, a flasher rig. And we've determined that the baits are sitting on the bottom with the stray line rig. There's not enough current here. So we've gone back to the ledgers and we're starting to produce snapper again. To make a dropper rig, tie two 10 centimetre droppers on a metre and a half of 60 pound black magic tough trace. The best knot to use is a long line dropper knot. Then attach a pair of wasabi 5 bar O hooks. At the bottom of the rig tie a large loop with a double overhand knot and then attach a sinker between 4 and 6 ounces. Snapper leads are best. Shall we do it, eh? Does that count as one or two? <laughs> um, I think it's two. That is in my heart, it's like a good fish. Yes, the box can catch big ones. <laughs> Great fun on the slight line. We're getting good snapper in the two to four kilo range at a pretty constant rate. It goes quiet for five or ten minutes, then they come through in another wave. This one hit nice and hard, so I can tell he's a goodie. <laughs> nice well fed snapper. Oh, I got it. Oh. Trying to get under the boat, under the rope here. Oh, here, oh. oh. Is that a nice one, is it? Yep. Is that a keeper? Yep. While the snapper snatchers and ledger rigs were picking up the fish when there was not much current, as the tide started to run, some of the crew switched back to stray line rigs using a one ounce sinker and big baits on a two hook fixed rig. A move that would pay dividends for one lucky angler. As the tide changed, the fish went a bit quiet. So the skipper shifted to a new spot that fished better on the running tide. Keep winding if it goes slack because sometimes they swim upwards. Pressure's on, Andre. <laughs> oh, pulling line, pulling line. Yeah. Can you translate to the viewers? Can you leave the rod? Don't bend it! Concentrate. You got the world watching me, buddy. Oh, it's gone. Okay, I'm hanging on to this one then. <laughs> it ain't getting away. Here it is. Yee hoo! Not bad. Still got to beat that other guy. Oh, there we Nip go. Nip to this one, please. Dinner. Hold them there, don't lift them up. Here comes the net. <laughs> it's a nice fish. Not bad, not bad. Yes. <laughs> we just moved to a slightly different spot because the fish went a bit quiet and uh, the new spot's been a bit quiet, but all of a sudden there's two nice fish coming. I've just got a, a keeper. It's the thing doesn't matter if you're on a charter boat or fishing uh, by yourself. Sometimes you've just got to move to keep the fish going. We're eating the squid well today. <laughs> one of the South African guys had hooked up on a good fish. His mates were giving him plenty of stick, telling him that he'd hooked a stingray. But the way the fish was fighting, I was convinced it was a snapper. Hopefully he would get it to the boat and we would find out who was right. The whole crew stopped to watch Heinrich play this fish. A good lesson for anglers was the way Heinrich played this fish. He kept himself and his rod and reel well balanced. He kept a bend in the rod so the line did not go slack and he did not pump too high when he was lifting the fish, which keeps maximum pressure on the fish the whole time. 
And when the fish was running and shaking its head, he let the rod absorb the pressure and let the drag on the reel do its job. There's always anticipation close to the boat when someone's got a decent fish on. Too much pressure than the last fish on the boat. <laughs> Put my camera on the water before it gets away. Yeah, I'll grab it. Coming. Oh, okay. No, oh. get a net, get a net. Wow! Oh. 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 Wow! Okay, whiskers. Yeah! Well, it does your moves of us. I told you he's big, big snapper, mate. That's what I said. How <laughs> <laughs> did? Look at the bait. Nice slab of kawai. Man. Oh, yeah. Man. Watch your camera. Take a minute. Yeah. Beautiful. Wow. That's good. Made my day. That's the way to end the day. Just straight yeah. through, though. <laughs> Coming up. Darren goes for a dive at Goat Island and meets Monkey Face. Fifty minutes north of Auckland is the Goat Island Marine Reserve. The staff at Goat Island Dive have created a no-fuss operation that can fit you out and give you all the help you need to go underwater and see sights like Monkey Face, this big old snapper. People of all ages can enjoy the sights with the right advice. All you need is a mask, snorkel, wetsuit and fins, all of which can be hired if you don't have your own. You can expect to see fish in the first few metres from the beach. Another organisation that puts people in the water is EMR, short for Experiencing Marine Reserves. Headed by Samara Nicholas, EMR puts hundreds of school children and their parents through a programme where they learn all about marine reserves and what's in them. It's a wonderful programme to do. With EMR, each group of children have an adult and a boogie board to use for safety. EMR ensure the children understand that nothing is to be touched or disturbed in a marine reserve. Crayfish as well as big fish can be found in very shallow water. Fish are not to be fed as this encourages unnatural behaviour. The snapper population from small to very big is very healthy. They are also much easier to approach than outside the reserve. The Lee Marine Reserve, or Goat Island as it's also known, was established in 1975. It's been extremely successful, catering for thousands of visitors every year. The underwater terrain offers all sorts of interesting country to view and swim through. There is large kelp forests, which if you go slowly and look closely under, act as a canopy for all sorts of marine creatures. The most prominent and dominant fish are the snapper, and even after 40 odd years hunting them, I never tire of seeing them up close like this. If you dive a marine reserve, it's important not to chase the fish. Lie dead still. Any movement you make towards a fish, do it slowly. A large snapper like this could be well in excess of 30 years old. Dad takes one of the kids down for a closer look. To think before man overfished the ocean, fish like this were a common sight in shallow coastal waters.
A wetsuit not only keeps you warm, it acts as flotation as well. The bright suits are for safety. It makes it easy to spot the group from a long way off. As I said, the snapper are thick here, but there's other species to enjoy as well. Look for the smaller fish in things like this leather jacket as an example. Red moki are a very pretty fish. They don't travel far and they tend to live in the same area and have a favourite rock or overhang they go to. As I said earlier, slow down and look closely. There's all sorts to see. If you are not into diving, the glass bottom boat's another way to experience the reserve. It's a very stable platform with very knowledgeable staff that will put you into the right spots and show you the big fish. When snapper get this big, they really start to show the wear and tear from the years. The big lump on his nose is like a callus from digging things out of the sand or the rocks. Some kids build up their confidence really fast with the EMR's guidance. This little guy is really at home in the ocean, and the inhabitants seem keen to see what he's up to. Put Goat Island Reserve on your bucket list. <laughs>